All right, so hi everyone. Today we have Andrew Hollum joining me for a discussion. Andrew is a personal finance journalist, speaker, and international best-selling author of many publications. Andrew has also been featured on many media outlets such as CNBC and Washington Post, and also happens to be the first person to have a number one selling finance book on Amazon. So Andrew, thank you for joining me today. <laughs> well, not quite the first person to get one on Amazon. It makes me seem like really old, or maybe not because Amazon's not that old, but it was actually uh, the first person to have a number one selling book on Amazon USA, Amazon Canada, Amazon UAE, and Amazon Singapore. So there's just that distinction there, which was, uh, which was kind of cool. Right, so some specific regions. Um, yeah, 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 all those regions. So all those specific regions. Yeah, exactly. Right. So as always, I think it's just always best to um, start off with a brief introduction of yourself for the audience. Hmm. So yeah, uh, currently, I might as well start with where I'm at right now. I'm globally nomadic. So my wife and I, we don't really live anywhere. So if anyone's listening to this, you know, keep in mind, you'd be taking like financial advice or suggestions from a homeless person, as long as you're good with that. So uh, we've spent a lot of time living in a van, and, but a cool van, uh, a really cool van. We spent 17 months uh, a couple of years ago living in a, a 21 foot long Winnebago Travado as we, it's kind of like a Mercedes Sprinter, as we traveled through, a little bit through the Western US, but then most of our time we spent exploring Mexico and Central America. So, you know, I went into the Guatemala, Belize, El Salvador, Honduras. It was a, a failed attempt to get to Argentina. And the, uh, when we got to the border of Nicaragua and El Salvador, they ended up having a civil war going on. Just, you know, a minor, minor skirmish, which made things reasonably <laughs> unsafe for a couple of uh, yahoos in a camper van to, to try and go across the country. So I've been... Uh, doing a lot of writing and speaking and it's been my thing so i started out as a school teacher and i taught in canada and then i ended up teaching at a private school in singapore and i taught high school english and personal finance i've kind of had two careers sort of simultaneously and that really early on i met somebody who inspired me to become financially literate and that changed my my life's complete trajectory in so many ways i was able to do what i'd love to do which was teaching and teaching doesn't necessarily pay a massive amount of money, but because I was able to allocate my money efficiently, uh, spend responsibly, invest properly, I was able to build uh, financial independence in my 30s. And I continued to work because I enjoyed that. And then my wife and I decided we would take one year off back in 2014 and uh, one year off from full-time teaching. And that one year kind of extended to two, which extended to eight uh, and the speaking has really picked up. So, you know, I wrote a couple of books along the way. So while I was working as a teacher, I was also working as writer. So I had a column for uh, Canada's national newspaper, which is called the Globe and Mail. I was writing for Money Sense magazine. I had a, a column for Canadian business. I was writing for a U.S.-based financial services company called Asset Builder. And I started to obviously have a lot more free time when I stopped writing or when I stopped working full time as a teacher. And so, you know, these people asked me, can you, can you write more? So I was writing more and then that ended up uh, sort of transitioning into uh, or coupling with speaking engagements. So I was asked to speak in different places around the world. So at this stage, uh, I've spoken in more than 30 different countries on the ideas of personal finance, uh, wellness, overall happiness, wellness, life satisfaction, and investing. Right, and I, I think that's fantastic. Um, so when, when you are going to speak to these audience, what, do you, what is kind of some of, your, uh, of the feedback that you're getting um, in terms of like the obstacles that people are finding within personal finance? Mm, yeah, plenty. Uh, first of all, people are shocked that they didn't really learn about this stuff in school. I mean, that's, that's the first thing. Uh, they wish they had learned about this a lot earlier. Uh, sometimes you get financial service operators that are educating people, so financial advisors that are educating people, but in many cases, these people are just salespeople selling to trying to sell high commission-based products with high fees. So we're talking about mostly the really bad ones, really, and they're the most common, is... Uh, investment products that are linked with insurance companies. So basically insurance linked investment schemes like variable annuities that you have in the US, they're really, really common. 
but the fees on them are so high that the investor has a really hard time uh, actually making decent money on them. So in the United States, for example, a variable annuity might cost, uh, have hidden fees of about 3% a year. So, you know, to put that in perspective, if your investment before fees makes 6% in a given year and you're paying 3% a year in fees, you're giving up 50% of the pre-fee profit. Now, if you make, uh, if your investment makes 3% before fees in a given year um, and you're paying 3% in fees, you know, you're giving 100% of your pre-fee profit to the financial services industry. So this can be a, a really big challenge to try to show people and to teach people that these are products that need to be uh, at all costs avoided. But the unfortunate part is how prolifically they are sold. So you even have like, you know, teacher pension plans. Uh, I would call them pension plans, but I'm talking like, uh, like uh, 403Bs for school teachers in the US that don't they no longer have defined benefit pensions, but many of them have 403B options. And really conveniently, somebody comes through the school district and you know, ends up having just about everybody investing in a variable annuity-like product, which is absolutely horrific. There's some really cool groups. So like 403BYs is a really cool group that helps people figure out like what are the actual costs on the platform and how can we uh, end up speaking to the powers that be in your given sort of school district jurisdiction, I'm just talking about school teachers here, but it's a, it's a great example that would apply to anybody. Uh, how can we end up getting low cost providers that will service um, these good hardworking people and not rip them off? Yeah, right, absolutely. Um, so one thing I, I, I wanted to, you know, you mentioned allocating. Um, so I wanted to touch up on that. So in the instance where, you know, let's say you're saving and budgeting and doing all these, um, helpful strategies to obtain um, more money at the end of the month. What would you say are some imperative channels to allocate your resource to, um, you know, within a young age, um, for example, like a 401k, index funds, um, Roth IRAs, what are, what are your take on that? I think the first thing is to pay off high interest debt. And so a lot of people don't necessarily think about that, but if you if you have a car, for example, and you're paying interest on that car, and let's say the interest is more than five percent a year, in today's low interest climate, I would call that high interest debt. Likewise, a credit card, of course, which could be as high as twenty percent a year, that's what I'll call high interest debt. And in many cases, student loans will charge you more than five percent per year. Actually, in most cases, so. I call that high interest debt and, and paying that off is such a good thing. I mean, even before investing. So it might sound really conservative to say that, but if you have high interest debt and I would say anything that's charging you 5% a year or more. So I'm not including a mortgage here because mortgage interest rates are, they tend to be much lower. Plus you're dealing with an appreciating asset. Like a mortgage is a, you know, basically a house versus a depreciating asset, like a car, which lowers in value. But if you have like a workplace pension, for example, or workplace investment scheme, um, and let's say it's a 401k and your employer is giving you free money, absolutely take advantage of that match. So most definitely invest, regardless of how much debt you might have, don't say no to free money. So if your employer is giving you like a 50% match or a 100% match, uh, matching those contributions into your 401k, absolutely take advantage of that regardless of your debt. Um, but beyond that, I would say consider getting rid of high interest debt first before investing. If you have like a, a student loan debt, for example, and it's charging you 7% per year and you pay that off fast, or you just make that effort to get rid of that debt, that's equivalent to an after tax guaranteed return of 7%. So no one in the world right now can guarantee you an after tax return of 7%. The stock market certainly can't after taxes as a guarantee Right? There's no bond that could do it. There's no savings account that could do it. Um, there's no money market fund that could do it. So this is why you know paying off high interest debt actually makes a lot of sense. Right. Yeah. And um, I think that's very important. Um, you know, student loan is has been a topic that's been circulating for some time. Um, and also, uh, I think it's very important to understand your credit and always um, paying off your credit, your credit debt on time, so that you can build. Um, credit. And I had um, a guest recently who 
spoke on credit. And essentially we covered the importance of understanding your credit and essentially the opportunity cost that comes with having credit. Um, so I think that's very important. Um, and not, you know, also just paying off your debt would allow you to, you know, allocate your, your money um, to various different channels opposed to um, the, you know, large payments that typically come from student debt or student loan debt. Um, so for someone who's never, for a young adult who's never invested in the stock market, um, how do you believe they should go about doing so for the first time? Well, diversification is really important because it's a matter of putting your eggs in a variety of different baskets instead of putting all your eggs in a single basket. So many people will think, oh, well, they need to be able to buy individual stocks and follow the stock market, and they don't. So uh, the research on this is, is quite interesting in that people that buy like a low cost index fund or something like a target retirement fund, for example, which is a combination of stock market indexes that are fully diversified, giving someone exposure to the US market, the international market, and depending on their risk profile, uh, a bond allocation. And these are great. I mean, Vanguard's life strategy funds are very similar in this respect as well, where you could literally buy a single product. And with that single product, you could have access to a a global representation of stocks and bonds, again, depending on the risk tolerance that you choose. If you are a, a low risk, risk investor, you might want something that has a slightly higher bond allocation. It will be less volatile when markets jump up and down, but the long-term returns, we're talking sort of 15 years plus, tend to be lower if you have a higher bond allocation. So you can fit an allocation that's dependent on what your personal tolerance is for risk, but if you are purchasing one of these all-in-one index funds, you will end up having a really, really low cost investment platform. We're talking about something that will cost you as little as 0.1% you know, per year. And we were talking earlier about those variable annuities that have total costs of about 3% a year. There's a massive difference. I mean, we're really talking about like, completely different things here. So yeah, I would suggest, you know, opening up an IRA um, or making sure that you invest in a 401k, especially if it's matching. So make that your, your, uh, your main priority. Looking for a target retirement fund or a life strategy fund, which is an entire basket of indexes wrapped up into a single product. And then you don't have to follow the stock market at all. And, uh, and irrefutably and mathematically, you will beat over your lifetime about 85% of investment professionals over your lifetime. Like I'm talking about people that full-time follow the markets, follow the economic news, follow global interest rates, follow di different individual companies, professionally full-time, you will beat about 85% of them over your lifetime just with a simple portfolio of index funds. So this is, uh, it's irrefutably, it's irrefutable on a mathematical basis based on something that William F. Sharp explains really well. He's a Nobel Prize winner in economics. And he explains this really well in a, in a Stanford-based paper called The Arithmetic of Active Management. So kind of boring in terms of like uh, the actual premise in itself, but uh, what's not boring is the fact that you'll be the vast majority of professional investors over your lifetime. Right, and, and I think that's, that's a very interesting statistic um, and it's, I, I think that it's important to understand, you know, ways to allocate your resources, um, uh, the stock market, there are tons of ways to do so, whether it's, um, you know, trading for long-term or kind of day trading, but, you know, every, every, uh, investment strategy has their own risk. So I think it's definitely important to understand both ends, um, of the spectrum so that you can make the most appropriate decision for yourself. Um, so you also so you happen to I, I believe you were able to retire at the age of 30 is that correct well you know i never really fully retired and and i don't intend to but yeah i was financially independent in my 30s and i never really thought of it as uh like a goal because i was enjoying what i was doing i know when i was young like when i was 19 when i first started to invest i remember thinking about not working. I remember thinking about retiring and, and chasing that idea. And that was one of the reasons why I started to invest and, and invest as much as I did of my paycheck. 
but over time, I never really thought so much about it. Like I remember, you know, when I, I wrote the book Millionaire Teacher and people would interview me and they asked me, when did your account first exceed a million dollars? And, uh, and I, I couldn't really tell them because I didn't really know or didn't really care. And that sounds kind of strange, but, um, but I truly believe the less you look at your investment account overall, the more money you're going to make because behaviorally you're going to not so much be influenced by the gyrations, the emotional gyrations of the stock market itself. Uh, so, uh, yeah, there was, a. <laughs> it is kind of interesting. I, the, the, the less you tinker with your portfolio, the less you move things around, I think the less you're watching the uh, your investment performances, the better off you're going to be. Most people would be better off like uh, Rip Van Winkle, you know, that guy who goes to sleep for 30 years and wakes up. And uh, basically, if, if that were the deal for most people, they would end up with far more money than they, uh, than they actually will have because most people will speculate and, and uh, let fear and greed change or alter their investment decisions. Right. And uh, I, I definitely would agree that, um, you know, the stock market can have, you know, significant like emotional impact on investors. And that's why, you know, choosing a strong index fund with, you know, promising returns can be a good thing for, you know, long term. Um, essentially, you can just kind of invest and watch it uh, occur um, over time, um, you know, obviously, depending on the market. Um, but so I'm interested, you know, 30 years old, you know, being able to retire at this particular age, if, you know, you wanted to, um, I think that would, I think that's a pretty significant feat. Um, so I'm kind of interested in that journey. And essentially, if you could go back and do things differently, how you would approach it this go around? Mm, yeah, that's a great question. I think, uh, man, if I knew everything that I know now, I guess I would not have bought actively managed mutual funds when I started out. Uh, I probably would have spent less time buying individual stocks and I would have got into maintaining a portfolio of index funds at an earlier age, less messing around. Uh, so then it gives me more time to do some like far more interesting things. Nobody really wants to follow the stock market. I mean, if you do, you've got no life. There are way better things to do in life. Um, life is like a, it's like a terminal illness in a sense, like we're all going to die, right? As crazy as that sounds. I mean, it's, total to the reality we don't behaviorally often live like that so i look at life as this uh, dark hourglass and you know you're born with a bunch of sand in it and at birth it gets tipped and no one knows how much sand they have left and so when you think about the things that really bring you joy uh is it following the stock market and and day trading and and knowing full well that behavioral research behind this too says that we we dislike losses twice as much as we actually enjoy gains um I'd say get outside, like hang out with people, enjoy people. Um, so I think I probably would have done less than that, uh, less of the stock picking, less of the reading of the researching, the reading the annual reports of individual businesses. I, I spent a lot of time doing that early on. So if I were to do it all again, I, I wouldn't be doing that. And I'd be spending more time like focusing on perhaps seeing some different countries, visiting different places, meeting different people. Not that I spent like my entire life, you know, buried in a bunch of financial research, but, um, but I think that the time that I did spend doing that uh, could have been spent or allocated better elsewhere. Right. And so say, you know, your portfolio is, you know, seeing some success, we're having some gains. Um, what do you think is, is it best to just, reallocate and just like reinvest these back into the index funds or how should we, and I understand that um, if you sell in a certain period of time that it's taxed differently. Um, so how do you, how should someone approach like the gains that they're seeing? Like, should they hold on for a year or so? Obviously, you know, different financial strategies and whether you're day trading or not. Um, but in terms of like actually seeing gains in a portfolio, What's the best way to manage this to reach like the max and full potential? Well, I think first, like if you're really greedy, don't day trade because you'll make more money over your lifetime with a portfolio of index funds. With day trading, you might do well for a while, but the statistical evidence is so heavily stacked against you. And so that's one thing that's so, so important to think that there's only really one term that counts and that's the long term. And that's your actual lifetime. And so you don't invest or you don't sell until you actually need the money. And so most people need that money when they are you know, retired 
or the, and they would take out like a, an inflation adjusted 4% per year. So in a sustainable amount, or they could take a case where, you know, they might need the money for an actual purchase or a lifestyle purchase. So you might want to take a year off and travel. So at some stage you might want to sell for that. But, uh, but I would make, base the decisions on lifestyle. In some cases, you may want to sell something because you want to buy a house. But I wouldn't allocate or I wouldn't recommend selling something just because it's gone up by a certain percentage. I would think about investing a lot more seriously. It's not a game. Uh, it's not supposed to be fun. And it's supposed to be for uh, to use it to maximize your life. So how do we best do that? We best do that by not messing around and trying to be greedy. To be greedy is to put behavioral-based evidence and mathematical-based evidence in your favor and not trading it, not trying to sell it at opportune times. Stay in the market, just keep adding money to your portfolio of index funds um, for a lifetime of working and then withdraw an inflation adjusted 4% per year. And if you need the money for something, like my wife and I needed some money to buy a condominium, so we sold a portion of our index funds to buy a condominium. Uh, we wanted to buy uh, an, like an RV for my mom and dad. And so we needed some money. So we sold a portion of our investment portfolio and we were able to buy them a, a, a pretty cool RV. So yeah, that's, that's, that's generally my strategy. Right. And I think that is, um, you know, it is important to kind of have a understanding of your financial situation when investing. Um, I think one of the biggest obstacles is, is people want to see like, you know, people want to become a millionaire overnight. So when they do invest in the stock market, you know, they're keeping their eyes glued to the market and just, it, this is when the, you know, the roller coaster of emotion comes about. And so when it dips down a little bit, you might want to pull out or when it, you know, goes up, you want to, you, you know, you want to get out because everyone just wants to make the quick gains. But if on, in all reality, <laughs> yeah. if what we're looking for is um, financial freedom and independence, then you know the long-term strategy is is um, where we want to be um, considering. Um, so I definitely do think that's important. Um, so I did want to move into um, discussing some of the, the books that you have written. Um, so for the first one, uh, I wanted to discuss the Millionaire Teacher, um, and I'm particularly interested in this book because um, I believe this has um, this revolves around um you know becoming a millionaire based on like a working salary um and i find this interesting because prior to me venturing off and doing my business full-time i've worked as a life insurance agent and a tax um, i worked at a tax firm uh, for a couple months so i understand the obstacles in you know being a dual entrepreneur you know working and um, working on, you know, being employed and working on your side business or your business. Um, so I kind of wanted to get your perspective on that. On like having a side business. Right. So essentially kind of like being employed and you utilizing your salary in order to further, you know, your business venture. Hmm. Yeah, honestly, I, uh, I probably wouldn't have a lot to add to that. Um, <laughs> probably because I'm lazy. And so for me, my, my whole uh, prime directive early on for investing was to work as little as possible. So, uh, so you'd probably be able to answer that question more than I would in terms of using your salary to, to augment some kind of wealth with a business adventure. All I did was basically, I was a regular Joe. I had a salary and I just, uh, allocated part of that salary to my investment portfolio over time. And I didn't need to you know, invest a heck of a lot because I started from a really young age. And so I was able to let money compound over time. And I mean, when I say I wasn't able to invest a heck of a lot. It was relative to my income. I guess it was a relatively large percentage of, of my income because it wasn't particularly high. So somebody who's like a doctor or lawyer who looks at how much money I was investing on a regular basis might say, well, that's not, that's not a lot. And it's not. But because I started so young, the money was able to just compound like a snowball. And that's what ended up bringing me early financial independence. But again, I mean, for me, um, yeah, it's, yeah, some of your listeners might be disappointed to know that 
for me, my prime directive isn't, isn't to work very hard. So it's more about, more about life than anything. So I think with that question about the business, you could probably answer that much better than I could. Right. And, and it's just, I, I love, you know, getting this type of perspective because um, I feel like when we first, when people first venture out and, you know, begin their business, uh, a lot of times or in, you know, some scenarios, um, the individual won't have the working capital to cover all the overhead costs. So I think it is important to understand um, your financial situation so that when you do, uh, you know, end up venturing off that essentially in, you know, months time, you're not, you're not broke, you know, um, and then ultimately that would have to leave you to, um, you know, finding work elsewhere and ultimately holding off on the, you know, the business that you're trying to start. Um, but I would, so I wanted to go back to the millionaire teacher and I kind of wanted to s- if you could just kind of give us some insight on, you know, topics you discuss in this book. Well, I talked about how um, there's often this perception of what wealthy people do. And we, we're all drawn, like many of us are drawn to nice things, expensive cars, really nice big houses. And it's actually good and positive, as I talked about a millionaire teacher, to actually emulate the, the strategies and the lifestyles of the rich. The problem here, though, is that the people who are truly rich and the people who we just think are rich are often at odds with each other. They're not the same thing. So, for example, you could have a, a lawyer or a doctor who drives a Ferrari or a Maserati, lives in a really big house, takes five-star vacations everywhere, wears a Rolex watch, and you assume that that person is rich. Uh, in most cases, and, and this is going to be kind of surprised to, to people, but uh, most high-end cars are not actually driven by rich people. Sure, there are some rich people that drive high-end cars. There are rich people that drive Porsches, Lamborghinis, BMWs, absolutely. But most high-end cars are not driven by millionaires. They're driven by pretenders. So the people who end up with really high salaries but spend all of their income. And so there are certain people that we don't want to be emulating. And I talk about that in Millionaire Teacher. So when we look at what research suggests in terms of like the most popular car driven by American millionaires today, it's actually Toyota. If we look at how much they actually spent on their latest car, on average, it was $35,000, which shocking is, you know, like I have a live in an apartment complex and there are about 40 units in there. And uh, if I would go downstairs or at least it's an apartment complex, I just said I was nomadic before we own it. Uh, You know, we spend the summers there from time to time, but, if I go into the parking garage and I look around, Jonathan, most of those cars are worth over 35 grand. How many of those neighbors of mine are actually millionaires? Out of the 40 of them, I'd be super surprised if any of them were. So yeah, they have high income, but they also have high debts. And that's something that people need to figure out, hey, hang on a second here. Um, if that's what wealthy people do, and that's how they get to the positions that they're in, maybe I should start for sort of reframing some of those goals that I have. Likewise, too, one of the things I talked about in my book, Balance, so I published a book called Balance about two months ago. And it it looked into the notion of deferred gratification, which, you know, people think, oh, I have to defer gratification so that I can invest money for my future, which means, you know, I might want to buy something, but I shouldn't be buying that because uh, it's going to affect my bottom line. So I deny myself a pleasure today for some point in the future. In a way, Jonathan, that's an actual fallacy because research suggests that material acquisitions almost never boost our life satisfaction based on something called hedonic adaptability. So basically we get used to what we own. So if like I bought a brand new seven series BMW today, it would give me a sugar fix. Like it would be pretty cool. I'd get out and I'd really enjoy driving that, but only for a short period of time. And sooner or later, usually only a couple of months, It just becomes another car. It just becomes this other thing that gets me from point A to point B. So we get used to whatever it is that we own. And everybody can relate to this. Like, you know, even as a kid, when you were getting Christmas presents, you get a Christmas toy and you're super jazzed about it. You're playing with it. And it's not that long before it just sits in a closet and you don't use it. So we're not really deferring gratification when we're choosing not to spend our money on material acquisitions. Uh, And those are all depreciating assets when we're looking at those material acquisitions. Rather, it's kind of cool to look at like an overall balance. Like if we are going to spend money, spend it on experiences, spend it on doing things with people we love and respect, because these are the things that really enhance your life. Right. And I, and I completely agree. 
uh, I think um, the deferred gratification is something that's important, but also it's kind of recognizing, you know, your goals, your financial situation, and not always following, you know, the path that everyone's taking, but essentially the path that is required for you to take um, in order to achieve these goals in mind. Um, so I think that's very important, you know, to understand, you know, delay gratification just for the time being. Um, you know, if the goal in mind is important enough to you, then, you know, I would like to believe that we would take these um, actionable steps. Um, and I think that the biggest thing is just sticking to these steps, um, to these methods, you know, making sure that it's not just like a one, one, two week thing, but more so like something that becomes, mm -hmm. you know, an everyday thing um, for months and years at a time. And I think that's when most people find success is when they stick to a regiment long term, um, you know, despite all the difficulties. Um, so I think that is very important. Um, and so we are near the end of our timer. Um, so as a last remark, I wanted to discuss financial curriculum within the U.S. and essentially kind of get your perspective on our efforts currently and whether we're, we as a society and a community um, are on the right track to promoting financial education in all our schools. Yeah, it's such a tough question to actually answer without like going into the schools and seeing like I do know that there's a higher number of people that are embracing financial education within school districts, which is great. That's right. always going to be a good thing. But to what extent are they doing it? So, you know, is it just, a, you know, a short little one week thing or a two week thing? Or is it like a, a proper course? And I think that one of the challenges is that it's hard to like, if we fully mandated it tomorrow, and we said every state has to have a personal finance course. The problem with that, I'm say to graduate, and let's say, let's say they, you know, from grade eight to 12, you've got to have a, at least a semester. And I would love that like grade eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, every year have at least a semester dedicated to financial planning, uh, financial future. That'd be awesome. Cause I mean, that's the one thing that everybody is going to need. Everybody needs to spend money. Like everybody needs to, you know, when you're buying a house or you're renting a house, you're buying groceries, you're buying transportation. This is the ultimate reality, right? It's what we train school is supposed to prepare us for the future. And this part is a undeniable massive part of every single person's future. AP physics is not. Right? Algebra is not. Shakespeare is not. You know, but we have so many of these things that are mandatory, which is kind of crazy. But then the challenge here, Jonathan, is that who's going to teach it? So, all right, let's say we mandated it all tomorrow, and you end up picking the teacher in your school. Are they passionate about it? You know, I think, too, once we mandate it, we actually have to start putting teacher training sessions in play where you could say, okay, I was trained to be an English teacher, like a high school English teacher. I think you need to be trained to be a personal finance teacher, middle school, personal finance teacher, high school, personal finance teacher. We're getting somewhere now. Like if we do that, then we're getting somewhere. But just to have some willy nilly thing where somebody who's, you know, they teach geography and they don't even really want to teach personal finance. It might not be the passion, but they're told, wow, well, we're mandated. Now we've got to do it. Um, you're going to get people doing all kinds of goofy things that aren't that effective. So yeah, we need to, the progress is being made, but progress continues to uh, should continue to be to be pushed for something uh, I think much more serious and comprehensive. Right, and I think you you were just spot on on you know your remarks on that. Um, I've been so there's tons of circulating news going on. Uh, I think recently, I believe either the mayor or the governor of Florida, Mayor DeSantos, um, he they've recently passed a bill which requires students to uh, take, I believe it's one financial literacy course that's worth 0.5 credits. Um, so this is something that was recent. I, I, be, I believe this bill was in uh, a couple of weeks ago. And in terms of Massachusetts and where we're kind of heading, uh, they did a survey in 2019. Um, it's the first of its kind. And it was ultimately um, halted due to the pandemic. But they've recently presented the survey and, you know, came out with their findings uh, pretty much, I believe, last month. Uh, last month. So I, I watched their video. I looked into the bill that they proposed. And in the survey, a lot of the difficulties that they found 
was, like you mentioned, that one, we would need to have uh, teachers being trained within, you know, personal finance. And when they did survey teachers to get their perspective on whether this should be taught or not, a lot of the teachers, one, agreed that it should be taught, but a good majority of them felt that they weren't fit or suitable to, you know, teach it to the extent that um, it should be taught. And then, so another obstacle that this <clears throat> survey presented was um, requirements, and it was educational requirements. And so when they surveyed principals and students, they, and superintendents, the one thing that they kept hearing back was that they need, their, their biggest priority is getting their students to have a passing like MCAS grade. So a specific, like all like the, the students within a district had to have a, you know, a percentage of um, passing grades uh, for the MCAS. Um, that was like a big requirement for some of these teachers and within their like contracts. Um, so that was another big obstacle. And the next big obstacle is, I believe it was social inequalities. So reaching communities um, with less resources and funding um, to be able to, to provide, you know, these resources to those schools. So there are, you know, there, it's, there are tons of obstacles in actually implementing, um, you know, financial curriculum within the U.S. I think the big thing we have to do is find the, the root um, the root cause and like of you know all these obstacles and I think from my research and due diligence I believe one of the biggest obstacles is the requirements of education so teachers in schools can't really necessarily implement this for many reasons but it's it seems that they're honed in on you know the MCAS and I think that if we wanted to really implement uh, you know financial curriculum then we have to go up the ladder and you know whether that's reaching out to the organizations of MCAS and, you know, having them change curriculum or, you know, consider it, uh, I think that would be a step in, you know, doing so. Because ultimately, you know, this is kind of a, a system that has been in place. I, it was funny, I, I saw a meme, it was like a funny clip art. And essentially it showed, on one side, it showed like uh, computers and cell phones and like the, like an 80 year progression. And then on the right side, it was students, it, like a classroom in like the 20s or 30s, and then like the 80 year progression, and it was <laughs> very similar, yep. same. So I think it's kind of, I think it is outdated, uh, some sort of a legacy model. You know, like you said, we don't really all need to be learning about uh, Shakespeare at a certain particular moment. Um, I think going up to, you know, starting at the higher levels and then branching down to, you know, communities and, um, you know, uh, states and districts seeing how we can implement financial curriculum in that way um, is important. But in all, I think it's important to just amplify the, the awareness of financial literacy so that lawmakers and, you know, state representatives are aware of this, you know, growing situation in the U.S. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's funny, you know, we're talking about the things that are mandatory in school and I think about things like uh, like higher level mathematics. Let that be an elective, for sure. Um, but personal finance, make that mandatory. Mandatory. Right. And I think the biggest thing is implementing this at an early age. And one of the uh, one of the obstacles they presented in the survey was that a lot of um, a lot of these topics of personal finance can be sensitive for certain individuals depending on their financial situation. So it's finding like a middle ground of how to introduce money as a concept of value um, and tool opposed to you know kind of introducing money and having you know for having it neglect others uh, just because uh, of their financial situation you know you can't really get everyone engaged but it's definitely an obstacle and it's something that i like you mentioned i believe that you know teachers or those who are going to be uh, implementing this financial curriculum should be, you know, trained uh, to do so. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Right. So yeah, I definitely think we're in, you, you know, we're heading in the right direction, but there's definitely a lot more that could be done. So, um, so we are near the end of our timer. Um, so do you have just any last remarks, anything you'd like to say? No, I think keep doing what you're doing. 
you know, talk to interesting people, build an audience, get people thinking about this sort of thing. Uh, I think it's really powerful, really powerful and helpful. So yeah, thank you. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the big goal is 50 out of 50 states to have implement some sort of financial curriculum um, within the U.S. We're not quite there, but I believe that uh, we are heading in the right direction. Massachusetts, there we're currently we have a couple initiatives out right now. Um, one being the Baby Bonds Task Force, which is a task force created by the Treasury here in Mass. And essentially, there's only I believe three other states that implement this type of resource. And essentially, the goal here is to create a bond, a baby bond. So for every newborn child in Massachusetts, they will be born with a bond um, of, you know, however much amount that they won't be able to utilize up until they're 18. So um, I think that's a, I think that's a great initiative. Um, I believe New Jersey is among the other state that have this currently. Um, so yeah, there's definitely a lot of initiatives happening. And, um, you know, I think it's us doing, you know, our thing and amplifying you know financial literacy and just the combined effort would ultimately you know get us there yeah absolutely right so thank you yeah so awesome um so thank you again i, I think i found this uh incredibly insightful and you know i hope you're you're currently in panama panama city panama city the country of panama yeah nice. so not florida but the country of panama for I'll, now yeah. i'll see weather over there right now the weather's always awesome. That's why we're here. <laughs> yeah, awesome. So I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and your vacation. And um, I'd hope to uh, stay connected. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Jonathan. Take care. Thank you. You as well. Bye-bye. All right. Awesome. So I'm going to cut it right there. Um, but how'd you think it went? Yeah, it's good. Good. Yeah. Um, I didn't want to dive into too much like with investing because, you know, for the disclaimer, you know, fi not financial advice, but I think we, you know, covered some good topics, um, more so like your perspective on a couple of things. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. Cool. So I'm going to have this edited. Um, it doesn't seem like there's going to be much editing need, need to be done. Um, but essentially, I'd like to stay connected. Um, when I do go ahead and post, I'll pretty much just send you out, uh, send you an email. Are we, connected on LinkedIn by any chance? I don't think so. I don't think so, but we could be. You'll be able to give it a quick check, eh? Yeah. Um, the only reason I mention that is because when I do go ahead and post, I just like to, uh, you know, tag you in my post. I'm kind of very active on LinkedIn. So that's kind yeah, of great. my episodes. And then, you know, YouTube, that's uh, yeah, yeah. where they will be posted. Yeah, connect with me on LinkedIn if we're not connected, and then that'd be awesome. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Well, sounds great. So I'll let, I'll let you enjoy the rest of your day. Um, and yeah, let's stay connected. All right. Sounds good. Yeah. Thanks so much, Jonathan.